It is truly a pleasure and an honor for me to host Professor Robert Haralik for uh, this week's talk, seminar talk at uh, uh, Computation and Medicine Bioinformatics, also co-hosted by uh, Michigan Institute for Data Sciences. Uh, Robert uh, doesn't need any introduction, but maybe I just give like a few points about his um, outstanding work and career. Uh, Dr. Harlick started his work as um, a principal investigator in NASA working on remote sensing. So that's the part that, you know, he started working on image processing and essentially created the field of majority of field that we know as image processing. At the same time, he worked on the field of you know, related field computer vision. And in particular, he worked on uh, 3D geometry for you know, analyzing images for uh, on more one or more perspective uh, projection views. Um, one thing that most of you are familiar with is the work that Professor Harlick did in 1970s on uh, creating a set of image feature uh, analysis technique, which we call them, you know, uh, GLCM that are based on uh, spatial gray tone co-occurrence uh, texture features. This is essentially a paper that Robert published in 1973 in IEEE journal in, in um, uh, man, systems man and cybernetics. This is one of the uh, highly cited papers in, in the field of engineering. I think I checked that recently, it was over 26,000 times cited. And I can tell you that if we look at the curve, the curve is still going up. And people in my lab know that in many of our research, we are still using uh, Robert's uh, uh, features for texture analysis. They're truly uh, fundamental for the field of image processing. Robert also worked on um, shape analysis and, and uh, um, um, working on mathematical morphology for different types of images. He worked on uh, a number of different uh, fields of biomedical image analysis. He worked on X-ray images, he worked on echocardiography. And when I say he worked on this, mostly I mean he created these fields for us and we are uh, essentially uh, following the, the fundamental work that he did. Uh, Dr. Haralik is a fellow of IEEE uh, for his contributions in computer vision and image processing. Uh, he's a fellow of International Association for Patent Recognition, IAPR. He has been the uh, president of IAPR since 1996 uh, uh, up until, I guess, 1998. He's been um, uh, in the editorial board of many IEEE and, and ACM transactions, and I don't want to go into the details of that. So what we want to do, uh, what we do today, I'm not going to uh, talk about uh, Robert's work on subspace classifiers because he's going to talk about that. I just want to say that um, our own uh, Jonathan Grayek, uh, Dr. Grayek, who worked with us, uh, is PhD was on this topic and he worked under co-supervision of Professor Harlick. So we have this strong connection with uh, one of the founders of, of the field. And Robert, this is a great pleasure again for us to have you here. Without further ado, I, I uh, let you um, um, uh, talk about your research, research on uh, subspace classifiers. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. I'm not sure I recognized all the things that you told me about <laughs> because all of those are in the past. And, you know, we don't live in the past. And the uh, future for me is now, is in certain respects very much like the future was for me in the uh, 1970, 69, when I got my PhD degree. So. Yeah, I've been in the university systems now for over a half a century. Today's talk is going to be on subspace classifiers. Let's get that up. And it's a counterculture talk. 
By counterculture, I mean um, that if you look where the, the main research is being done, let's say in machine learning, it's uh, all related to neural nets, deep learning, and, and the advances there. And today you cannot get a paper published um, that has anything to do with classification if you don't have comparisons with deep learning. And if you do have comparisons with deep learning and you say the method is better in whatever application you're looking at, uh, you'll raise a bunch of eyebrows. So uh, you're in a counterculture quick talk and I, I hope that I can inspire you to see the things that I have seen, I have intuitive about uh, this, this method. So let's begin. Since we're working in subspaces, actually multiple subspaces, we're really trying to solve a complex problem. And complex problems, it's not unusual to tackle them by breaking the big problem, we'll call it the global, global problem, into smaller subproblems. Each of the subproblems can be solved independently. And because the problems are small enough, it may be possible to do it optimally. And then you combine the solution to the subproblems to obtain the solution to the global problem. And um, often uh, this uh, works very well. Uh, the idea of the decompositions is to maximize the dependencies within each of the smaller problems and minimize the dependencies between each of the smaller problems. And then you thread together the solutions to the smaller problem to make the solution to the larger problem. Decompositions occur in many ways. Uh, and in these ways, it's often the case that there's actually theoretical papers that deal with aspects of the natures of these kind of decompositions and their optimality. Recursive decomposition, data decompositions, functional decompositions, search space compositions. Well, we're not serving in any of these. I just want to mention these in passing. So sometimes the solution to a decomposed problem is optimal, and sometimes it's suboptimal. And the solution obtained by a decomposition can be bad, it can be approximate, and it can be close to being optimal. And sometimes it actually is because there's a theory that says it will be under certain conditions. So let's go into the subspace classifier. The subspace classifier is one that projects the measurement tuple to one or more subspaces where the projected tuple is processed and the processed projected tuples are combined in a way to form an assigned classification. It is typical for the projection operators to be orthogonal projection operators. It's not unusual for the projection operators to be axis aligned. And indeed, the subspace classifier by other names has existed, well, for over a half a century. For example, the classic feature selection, where you have many, many dimensions, you select the most relevant um, dimensions called features, and you use those in the classifier. That indeed is an axis aligned orthogonal projection. It's a, you, you're, you're working in a subspace. Of course, in those years, it wasn't called subspace. Uh, in particular, the, the, this particular method, which gets to be called the n-tuple method, was written about by Bledsoe and Browning in 1959 in the Proceedings of the Eastern Joint Computer Conference. 1959. You know what computers were in 1959? Big, huge rooms with big use air conditioners, raised floors, racks upon racks upon racks. And even in some of them, you didn't provide electricity directly, you provided it to a motor generator set. And then the output of the generator was the one that 
that provided the uh, electricity to the equipment. And those rooms, which I'm now thinking about, 19 in the 19, even in the 19, the mid 1960s, early 1960s, the simplest of all of the smartphones has more capability in it than those machines had in those days. All right, so printed character recognition was a, an important thing in those days. The each character is after its own normalization steps and so on is in a, an image basically of I Rose by J. Columns. And um, the automatic thresholding was done in analog and it produced a uh, image that was either zeros or ones. And the method was designed for table lookup hardware because there wasn't much computational ability. And you couldn't hook up your machine to the largest of the IBM machines or like the GE 635, which was the first uh, time sharing machine. You couldn't do that because your, uh, the value of doing the character recognition and the cost of using those kind of machines uh, was completely out of balance. The cost was much higher. Uh, I just want to say something about uh, Browning, because most of the talk is going to be about Bledsoe. Uh, about 15 years after 1959, he wrote a book, The Climate and the Affairs of Men. And uh, during the time between 59 and let's say 75, when the book came out, he worked on um, trading commodities, particularly uh, of, of, of crops. And my suspicion is, is that the technique he used was the, actually the n method from that paper, worked over to uh, commodity tra trading, and I think he made a lot of money. And that's all I'll say. <laughs> okay. So let's take a look to see <laughs> exactly how this works, which right here is a, a, a pixelated image. And uh, let's see here, uh, nine positions have been selected. Those nine positions represent positions of, let's just call it uh, features or dimensions uh, that constitute a particular subspace. In the original technique, those are chosen by random. So a small number of pixel positions for each subspace are randomly selected. And there are multiple sets. And again, each one of these sets is uh, random. Um, in the first implementations, these sets were mutually exclusive. Soon after it got implemented, things were tried with overlapping sets. We mentioned before the pixel positions were thresholded. Again, this is on the analog side. And the um, zero or ones you can think of as just concatenating all the binary values to form a binary number. This number was used to access uh, in a memory array. It became the address. And for each character class, you have as many memory arrays as there are randomly selected pixel position sets. Uh, here's a, a, just a little quick sketch uh, about the mathematics. I, I just wanna say on the side that the pa these papers, when they got published, and there was a huge number of papers that were published uh, after, um, 1959 paper. Uh, the people who did the publishing often had an electrical engineering diagram. If you were to go to look at those papers to find out what was going on in those papers, you would struggle a little bit because the way they illustrated what was going on was to do an engineering diagram and not just a general mathematical statement as to what it was. So you had to dig into it to figure out what the mathematics was. 
All right, here we have M pattern sets of N, each of which are N randomly selected pixel positions. The uh, printed character produces, therefore, M, N digit binary numbers, which we'll call B1 to BM. There are K character classes, and there are a bunch of tables, which are indexed by the uh, pattern set and by the class. So we'll call them TMK. And if you look up what the argument is, uh, it was the fraction of times character in the training set of class K has the binary number BM for, the, for its address to the mth pattern set. And then the kinds of computations that were, were done was to take the product, because under a conditional independence assumption, the product is something that is also a probability uh, entity. Sometimes it was done by taking sums, and sometimes it was done by taking logs. Uh, and if it was taking logs, often a small uh, increment was added to the argument so that you didn't get a log of zero. How did the assignment work? You assign the character to the unique class K star, if there is one, for which that uh, score is highest with the condition that the score had to be greater than some minimum value here called epsilon. You don't have that, you would have a reserved decision. Um, one of the problems with various of the deep learning schemes is, this, is that they don't have a way of controlling for false alarms. It's not usual that it's, it's there and it's there in a probability form. Uh, that epsilon, the higher you make it, the fewer false alarms you have. But of course, you also increase the number of reserved decisions. And I think since this talk is in part sponsored by a, a medical group that is doing work in this area, um, when you make real machines and you put them out in the field and you want to have highly trained people such as doctors use them, it's much better for the machine to say, reserve decision than to make a classification which has a higher probability of being wrong, right? It's better to say, I can't handle it than to indicate you're stupid and you make a bad decision. Now, there are a variety of all kinds of alternatives. I'll just uh, touch on uh, one or two. Uh, again, we have M pattern sets with N randomly selected pixel positions. The printed character produces the M binary numbers, one binary number uh, for each of the M pattern sets. You have K classes. And now our table lookups are just going to be indexed by the um, the, the M pattern sets. And if you take the address that you get from the binary numbers and uh, of the pixel positions, and you put it as an address into the table TM, it's not holding a, a number, it's not holding a fraction, not holding a probability. It's holding the set of classes associated with this particular address for the M pattern set. And, and there are a variety of ways of even doing this, but I won't go into that. But it's a set. The computation, you take the intersection over all of the M pattern sets of the TM of their respective addresses, BM. And you assign the character to your unique class K star. If there is one where K star is in that set and the number that's in that set is one. If there's more than one, then you reserve decision. Here's how it looks like a sort of like a block diagram. The uh, initial uh, features, F1 to FD, these could be real numbers. If they are real numbers, you have to do a quantization. First difference between this and neural net stuff. You have to do a quantization. 
And you can see for the second layer, uh, A1 to AM, these are address generators. And you can see um, that each one of these address generators are picking up three of the features, three of the quantized features and forming an address of it, which, are at, which is used to address the corresponding table. And then the address for all of these and this one implementation here is shown is uh, summing them all up and you get a score for the kth class. Then all the scores go into an, a, a, an index generator, a class index generator. And the simplest one of those is, is just to take the argmax. Uh, here we showed again that uh, it's not just the, the K star that has the R max, it's the K star whose maximum one is sufficiently greater than all of the others. So there's an epsilon and that controls also longer. Uh, just a little bit about the, the math. I'm not gonna do much of this, but just to show you the index um, tuple is the way we do it. Suppose you have a five dimensional feature vector or a tuple A, B, C, D, E for its corresponding values of features F1 to F5. Suppose you project the measurement vector A, B, C, D, E to the third and fifth feature. The resulting is a tuple C, E, obviously. But if you just show C, E, you've lost from which the features C and E came. In the database world, Every value comes from the field and the connection between the field and the value is actually never lost. And so we use an index tuple. The index sets serve as the field name. So the tuple A, B, C, D, E is written as a pair. The first is the set of um, indexes for the features, in this case, one, two, three, four, five, followed by the tuple. C, D would be written as a pair three, four, features three and four with the values C and D. A, B, and E would be, could be written, for example, as the uh, features of one, two, five, and A, B, and E as the corresponding values. And if you had a tuple list, the tuple list would be written as a pair, the first component telling you what the field names are, the second component telling you <coughs> the list. So suppose that S is a tuple list with respect to the index set I. Index set I is indexing all the features. I have a subset of those index set, of this index set I, we'll call it J. And now we can talk about the projection IS from the space indexed by I to the space indexed by J just by writing pi for projection. J with the index set that the projection is of the index set IS and it produces a new index set JR. This J agrees with the subscript. I use the word projection. Here's an, an, an example of an axis aligned projection. Um, if you're familiar with the, the linear algebra idea of projections, uh, this is not a projection into the space that you start with its projection into the subspace. Um, and it, the subspace is the one that has the relative coordinates. All right, so here I have a diamond consisting of all the points marked in red, projected to the X1 axis. And here you have pi one, the projection to the feature whose index is one of this set, which is one, two, and R as the list of the points and likewise for the second axis. All right, let's look at the two, two, the, uh, the two class case without loss of generality. It just keeps our everything simpler. Our index at I is from one to V. F1 to FV are the V quantized features. Here I'm just saying them already quantized. L1 to LV are the corresponding range sets. The variables, uh, or the features here are called XV. XV takes its value in its range set. The measurement space is the Cartesian product of the range sets. And if I have to have a training set for class one and a training set for class two, 
we have, uh, in this case, I just showed to be the same number. Uh, the class one uses X1 to XZ, the class two uses Y1 to YZ. The XZs, of course, are in the measurement uh, space. And the Ys are for class one, the Xs are for class one, the Ys are for class two. The pattern sets index the subspaces. And so I can take to a projection of the full, um, let's call it the full feature vector, Ixz, projected to the mth subspace whose index set is Jm. And I get another index tuple. The index tuple is in the Cartesian products of the range sets that are involved in the um, chosen uh, from the chosen pattern set. So this would be for the mth little mth one. Same thing for the uh, the y's. So from this kind of thing, we can make tables. So for example, if we just want to um, get probabilities in the table, <coughs> then TM1 is the table, the nth table for class one. The number of times in the training set that I get a index tuple, IXZ, whose projection onto the nth is Jm of u. And it's the number of times that happens divided by z, which is the number of instances in the training set. And from this, we develop scores. So for example, here I'm just showing uh, the addition. You could also have the addition of a log of those tables. And the score. You assign class one if S1 of IQ is greater than S2 of IQ by an amount epsilon and vice versa for class two. And otherwise, if both of those are not set, neither of these are satisfied, we do a reserved decision. And just in passing, um, suppose we just had this one dimensional array, which you could think of as a pedagogic example of a string and you scan along and each one of these uh, three positions is uh, analogous, for example, to what a small little convolution would be doing in the early layers of a deep learning machine. So there you are with the range sets, uh, the index sets for the um, projections. And if I wanted to tell you just uh, and totally, what's in with the classifiers, I need a measurement space, calligraphic M, a number of classes K, <clears throat> a number of subspaces M. I have the collection of the subspaces in calligraphic J, and I have a collection of the tables in calligraphic T. So I have a six tuple that defines what the classifier actually is. So with the uh, neural nets, and therefore correspondingly with the deep learning, there's a universal approximation theorem. The universal approximation theorem says, <clears throat> given any sufficiently simple, and I won't define it, function that you would like to approximate, the neural network with multiple layers, actually minimally two layers on the inside, is sufficient to do an approximator. And that's one of the, one of the things that's, that's important for the neural nets. Well, this, we don't have a theory for this, but I have a conjecture. But if I had a V-dimensional subspace and I had a given classification function, F, and just for the sake of uh, simplicity, I, I just say that it provides a class index of zero or one, two class case. There's a probability distribution P on the measurement space. 
if f is sufficiently simple, then for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a number k smaller than v and a number m, which is uh, smaller than uh, vk choose k, vk, v, v choose k, and a two class n tuple subspace classifier such that the probability that I have a tuple in the measurement space where the class given to x by f is not equal to the one that you would get from the classifier is less than epsilon. Now, the whole thing in this is what do you mean by this zz simple? I'll say a few words about that later, but just let it go that this is at a place where some theoretical work needs to be done. Let's just make some comparisons now. These comparisons are simple, just to give you an idea. <coughs> Neural net takes floating point values. Each of the units computes a weighted linear combination of its inputs and the weights are initially set at random. The linear combination is input to an activation function. The activation function has bounded output is nonlinear. There can be multiple, multiple of these units in any one layer. The original form of the neural net, if you go all the way back to this late 1960s, was one, one um, interior layer. But of course, the, there can be multiple and the layers can be cascade, cascaded. And the geometry of the cascading is, has been often hand designed, although now there are some programs which try to do the design, the gen design of the geometry to optimize for you. And there's an iterative training algorithm that optimizes the weights for a given data set. For the n tuple classifier, in general, the first stage is going to be a quantization. Each unit has a table lookup memory to produce an output from the quantized values, which are used to form an address. The values in the table lookups are determined in one pass through the data. There can be multiple units in any one layer, meaning there can be multiple subspaces, which in general there are. And the original form of the n tuple classifier had only one in a layer, but indeed these layers can be cascaded. The geometry of the cascaded, it's cascading is initialized at random. There's an iterative algorithm for optimizing the index sets, defining the projections. So therefore the geometry of the cascading is automated and there's an iterative algorithm for optimizing the quantizing functions, neither of one of which, of which I'm gonna talk about. So for the neural net, you have to have a choice of the activation function. Usually the same activation function is employed in each unit, but the theory doesn't require this. <clears throat> the activation function has parameters which must be set by design. The activation function is nonlinear and the activation function bounds and compresses the unit's output. For the n-tuple classifier, the quantization function is different for each of the lines or the variables that are on each layer. Quantization function in general is nonlinear. And the quantization function bounds and compresses the values so that can be used to form an address for the unit's memory. <clears throat> I'll make the general statement that the n-tuple classifier can do everything the neural network does, modulo, the quantization, including the hidden layers. And now I'll say something that is surprising. The n-tuple classifier is more general. How is it more general? Just look at whatever brand neural net you, is your favorite. It's, it's really a function. It takes the input and out produces the output for the class. How about testing for the uh, uh, anti-nuclear uh, capsid uh, protein? Uh, those uh, people have also have to uh, fill the survey about the prior symptoms. Uh, up to no, the maybe you got the uh, Somebody's got the collection. It was hard to hear. Um, 
let me, uh, you'll have to ask that again. Yeah, you, you came up at a very important part of your talk, Professor, so we might as well let you make that point again. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to go on and then we'll go, go back to this. Um, why do I say the interval classifier is more general? Because if I have enough memory to make a sufficiently large table, I can implement any function just in one layer. And that's a special, special case. The problem, of course, is that the memory would have to be very large. Just to show a simple example, a decision tree can be put in an n-tuple form. A decision tree is a classifier whose structural form is a tree. Each node of the tree corresponds to a mutually exclusive subset of measurements space. The nodes of the tree are either decision nodes or leaf nodes, and in each decision node of the tree, a distinction is made that partitions its subset of measurement space, and each leaf node is associated with an assigned class. So let's take a look at its advantages. If you're understandable, use rules, quick online computation, continuous or categorical variables, and it provides a clear distinction of which dimensions are most relevant for accurate classification. On any branch down the tree, the decision region is specified by the conjunction of the constraints of the nodes in the branch. And there are many branches, each of which represent the disjunction of these conjunctions. So let's take a simple example. Where did the olives come from? Classes are Northern Italy, Southern Italy, or, or Sardinia. The measurements made are two different kinds of fatty acid measurements, icosinic and linoleic. Um, here's a scattergram, uh, which indicates, yes, these uh, different classes can be very well isolated. And the decision tree does exactly this. First, you look at the uh, iconosinoic uh, variable, and then you look at the linoleic variable. Here's the decision tree. If I do a binary quantization, meaning into two possibilities, one quantization for the first variable, one quantization for the second, apply that quantization, here's what I get. And we get exactly the same answer that you would get with the decision tree for this case. Uh, here again is the uh, diagram for the uh, n-tuple calculation for class K, and then the scores for all the class K get combined. But in particular, I want us to talk about the quantization because the first layer here was quantization. So here's a non-uniform quantization. Uh, it can be nonlinear. It can be non-monotonic. And so you have some generality here. Now we're going to talk about the calculation for the class, which uh, here we've already mentioned before was in ARD max. And in all of these things, if we wanted, we can do optimization for the projections, for the tables, for the combiner, and for the optimize the way the class index is determined. One of the ways of doing this is by uh, using conditional probabilities. And so, for example, um, the TMK, <clears throat> when you normalize it, is the estimated probability for the projected observation given class K. The uh, joint well, the, the prob th this is the conditional probability. This is the joint probability here. And by <coughs> the definition of conditional probability, it's the probability of K given the uh, projection. And so this tells us how to convert from the one form to the other. And if you write it in, with respect to the tables, you get something like this. So, we now can now say we have the output from the tables like we had before. 
we have a conditional probability converger, converter. It's given the prior probabilities. And it produces the probability of the class given the subspace of projections. We'll call them Q1 to QK, Q1K, each index by M. And we can assign to class K star when um, this conditional probability is greater than the corresponding probability for all of the others. Uh, now, this is, is actually, I said assignment. It's, it's really not an assignment. It's really producing uh, by the uh, pre producing index sets. And here, these values go into the score generator, which can do a sum, which is uh, similar in some sense to the, the sums that get done in, in random forests. So here is the class assignment. Uh, just another variation we're going to do in passing. It's called bleaching. If you look at the literature, there's quite a bit there of all kinds of variations that people have done. But this says here that we're going to look at each one of the tables. And we're only going to consider the tables where the values in the tables are sufficiently large, greater than this threshold. P. And we're going to count how many tables for which we observed that the value in the table was greater than or equal to D. And then uh, we're going to find the, uh, the K star, which maximizes that sum. And if we don't have a unique K star, I could also do that with the epsilon and the reserve decision. This is a typical example of what you might see in, in these papers, and not a mathematical statement, but actually a diagram. So here you see a three row by four, uh, four row by three column, little binary image. You can see here the, uh, by these lines, where the value or B is being taken from. And so we're taking a 0, 0, 1. And here's the table. 0, 0, 1 is the um, address to that table. And it says happened one time. But our threshold is 2. <coughs> and so the value for that is 0. Take another one. Uh, it turns out its uh, projected value is 0, 1, 1. You go into here, you find that it occurred three times. Three is greater than the threshold two. And so we have a, an output of one and so on. And you sum them together and you get a score of three. All right, now I want to just discuss a, an experiment. If this is the first of the experiments that we're going to be doing to understand what that ZZZ might mean in the conjecture I had um, that we have a general approximator. We're going to choose n, the dimension of the measurement space. The tuples themselves each take values. Each component of the tuple takes values 0 or 1. We take all the two to the nth tuples in measurement space and permute them. So the order is permuted. And you set the true class for the first half of the tuples to one. You set the true class for the second half of the tuples to two. And you set the probability of each tuple occurring to be just equal, one over two. This defines the, pro the population. No tuple that is assigned to class one is also has the possibility of, uh, I mean, the true class one uh, has the possibility of also having an instance of true class two. So not only are these really the training sets, but everything is set in such a way that we, are, we have defined the, the population probabilities. So in effect, there's no training, there's no testing, 
and a base classifier will produce 100% correct classification. So the experiment itself, choose R the dimension of the subspaces. And then you repeat this for Z times, for some large number. <coughs> you choose at random, M mutually exclusive subspaces covering all the M features. And when R, the dimension of the subspaces, do not, does not divide M, one of the M subspaces, actually you can do it with one or more, uh, has a smaller dimension. Uh, determine the accuracy of the subspace classifiers of fire using the product rule, for example. And then since you have um, multiple times it's being done, you can determine the classification accuracy order statistics, visualize those with a box plot, and graph the, block, the box plots as a function of R, the subspace dimension. So here's an example for a 10-dimensional subspace. Here you can see very easily the, the box plots. And you notice just the general characteristic the general characteristic is, is that the even with one dimensional subspace, it's not below a half, it's a little above half probability of correct classification. As the subspace sizes grow larger, the accuracy increases. And if you get up to a subscript subspace of size nine, there's a bigger jump between it and the, use a subspace of size 10, which would be the base classifier. And, and therefore, we have uh, accuracy of 100%. Next table shows what happens for a size two, a uh, size 20. And um, it's the same, the same kind of pattern with even a bigger jump between using subspace 19 for one, and then of course the other subspace would be uh, one, dimension one. And um, and the base classifier is a fire for size 20. Um, now, in this experiment, by design, there's really no relationship between the class and the tuple. And since there's no relationship, there's no structure. You can say there's no structure here, except whatever happens by chance. And we're going to start from this point of view and try to find out gradually, as we introduce structure, how these kind of curves change. These experiments were done by Alex Verdloff uh, just the other week. All right, I want to go to one last point, uh, sub, uh, the stacking of the subspace classifiers. And the stacking means here having a subspace classifier composed of layers of subspace classifiers. And each successive layer has fewer, smaller dimensional spaces. And the last layer has, enough, has a small enough dimension that the classification can be made by a Bayesian classifier. The output from these subspace classifier, each of the ones that are stacked, the output is not a class, but actually is a score. And it's not just one score, but it's the score for each of the classes. And in some sense, this is sort of analogous to neural net hidden layers. So we'll go through this very quickly. We just look at the numbers. We're going to start out an example with the total number of dimensions are 96. The number of subspaces per class is 12. And if uh, here we do get uh, eight dimensions for each of the mutually exclusive subspaces. Number of classes is three. So we have 12 subspaces for class, three classes. The total number of scores calculated is 36. So now we've gone from 96 to 36 dimensions. Layer two takes the 36 dimensions, 
number of subspaces per class is going to be nine. The size of each subspace is four. Number of classes is three. Three times the three classes times the nine number of subspaces per class nine is 27. So we now we've reduced the space from 36 to 27. Here the 27 is the number of mentions in the third layer. Number of subspaces per class is six. Here I've divided it into three fours and three fives in dimension. Number of classes is three. Three times six is 18. And so now we've reduced it now to an 18 dimensional space. I'm going to go another couple of layers. Three subspaces per class. Size of subspace is six. Number of classes is three. And <coughs> three classes times three subspaces per class is nine scores that are calculated. We'll do one more. Nine dimensions. Each subspace is size two, one of four size and one of five dimensions, three classes, three times two is six. We have six scores calculated. And now we have six dimensions. Number of possibilities per dimension is six. The size of the measurement space six to the six, we can use a Bayesian classifier and that's the way it ends. So I've quickly gone through some of the ideas in the Bayesian classifier. For those of you who are interested in um, looking further at this, let me say stop share, yes. Um, you can uh, take a look at this issue, January 2021, volume 51 of Systems Man and Cybernetics. And it's the second paper and this has a huge number of references and it's a survey paper with some suggestions for generalizations that, are, uh, that I didn't talk about, uh, but you'll find, you'll find them in here if you wanna go further or look at any of the, the literature. So this will, well, at this point I'd like to stop and take uh, questions. Thank you very much, uh, Robert. We we cannot like applause you the way we want, but you know that's that's the virtual version of that. Uh, so we have uh, a few minutes for the questions. Um, if you have questions, please uh, uh, activate your uh, mic and and just ask the question. We had a question before and I didn't quite understand it. Maybe it could be re-asked. While we're waiting, I, oh, Jonathan, go ahead. Oh, I, I think what happened was uh, you were talking about um, why you felt that the um, Antuple classifier was more general than sort of the function approximation and that was being done by you know, a typical, you know, deep network. And uh, I think, you know, that part, there was an interruption. We didn't hear uh, the conclusion of that, of that sentiment. That's correct. So Robert, I have a, uh, I think you might have mentioned that during the talk. I just want to emphasize that if you look at the comparison between neural networks and in uh, tuple classifiers, uh, can you tell me how we would like, you know, uh, compare them in terms of sample complexity in a, in a, way, in a, in a way that if you set like a, an accuracy level and a statistical confidence, fix it for the, for the two models and ask how many examples you want to, you know, train the, these models to achieve this statistical confidence and this like, you know, this accuracy then which one would require more examples, sample complexes? Well, the, this all depends upon the number of three parameters in the method. Um, if you design a classification method and the number of free parameters you have is greater than the number of degrees of freedom you have in the measurement space, the classifier is gonna wind up memorizing, if it's any good at all, it will tend to memorize. Uh, this is, memorization is well known. 
It actually goes back to the 1950s, I'll go back to. 1950s was a Cold War decade. And the submarines that the Soviets had were very quiet, much quieter than the American submarines. And at that time, the United States had the best computers, as simple as they were, <laughs> complex for the 1950s, simple in our terms today. And nobody could understand why. And uh, NATO began an investigation to try to find out what's going on. Um, MIT, or the, one of the labs at MIT, was given the task of finding out what was going on. Can you design a machine that would help us identify? Well, of course. And so the data from the, the sonar data, classified top secret at that time, was given to the lab. And they designed the linear classifier. And the accuracy was 100%. Navy was very happy. The Navy then put the classifier into hardware. Put the hardware on the submarines. And now you had the operator with his earphones and you had the, uh, the, the hardware implementation of a linear decision rule. And then the Navy was absolutely, um, what's the right word? I'll use the word depressed because the classification wasn't very good. But MIT was saying, oh, it's 100%. Well, you know what happened? The number of samples that they gave compared to the complexity of the classifier was small, and so they just memorized the result from the training set. They didn't use a training set and a testing set. They didn't use cross-validation. And from the, that year, for a whole decade, and those, those, in that time it was, it was called target recognition, but target recognition for the Navy, for the Air Force, for the Army was out because <laughs> of, this, of this issue. So you have to look at the complexity of the decision rule and the complexity, and it can, you can measure complexity by looking at degrees of freedom. What's the degrees of freedom for a, um, a measurement space or from a data set that you have? How many numbers? And you want that complexity to be at least, let's say 10 times more than the complexity of the decision. And I think there, there have been some studies, this is not an inherent fault of the deep learning stuff. It's a fault of the uh, researchers who didn't properly do cross validations and they made the classifier so good, it produced very good values on the training sets Actually, there have been papers now that have been written where a, a stop sign is the target. It has to be recognized. And they're showing um, pictures from of experiments that have been done. If you take a stop sign and you put some black blotches on it, and the class of the deep learning thing comes up with uh, some kind of an animal which has nothing to do with the stop sign. It doesn't even have the same appearance of the stop sign. But what's probably going on there is that the, the, the number of samples were not enough. Or to say it the other way around, then the number of degrees of freedom in the decision rule in the learning net, the deep learning net itself is too large. But anyway, people who have gone through some kind of statistical training 
you get to know these kinds of things. And I think that the, the group from maybe the, well, I'm gonna say the, let's say the mid 2014, 2015, the people who have dominated the, the deep learning by and large are people that didn't have that experience even though it's in the same field, because they're not looking at the older papers. The older papers, sometimes you're into something exciting. The older paper has nothing to offer. So here I gave an instance. This instance, by the way, you're not gonna find written about very much, um, but is, was, it was one of the things that did happen. There were other things that happened as well. And so the people who were doing the target recognition and the pattern recognition came to the knowledge that they had to watch this complexity. So did I answer the earlier exactly. question? Exactly, and, I, and I, that's, a, that's a great answer. I appreciate that having worked at Irem years ago and you would recognize <laughs> that name. We had that problem exactly. Uh, we put it into hardware, the whole thing. Uh, you know, everything you said, I've lived through. I mean, it, it was excellent, excellent description. Brian, you know that Robert used to, for at least a short period of time, used to live in Ann Arbor, if I remember correctly, Robert? Years, yes. Yes. I was actually yeah. with, uh, working at that time at Machine Vision International and as vice president of research. Oh, yeah. On leave, on leave from university. <clears throat> And at that time, um, I was working in a place that Steve uh, Sternberg, Stan Sternberg, was the president of. And Sternberg was very smart, and he actually designed hardware, at least the outline of the hardware that would do mathematical morphology for processing images. Yeah, we had two. We had the Cyto computer and the Accurate yes, system, yes, yes. John Dack and Houston, and all those guys. I mean, I grew up with that stuff, and what you say is exactly and, true. And we built those machines. But here's here's another example of, of communication. <laughs> so when Stan Sternberg would communicate, he would not communicate with the mathematics. He would not communicate from the statistics side. He would not communicate fully from the theory side. He would sit you down to a dog and pony show. Yes. And then the academics that would came to, came to look at this uh, quickly recognized hey, this, where's the theory? Where is the, you know, how does it all go together? He never did, did that. Um, so when I came along um, and I knew about the mathematical morphology even before uh, Stan Sternberg. Um, the two of us uh, talked about possibly going there for me. Um, and so uh, I was going to introduce the, the additional techniques for in those days it was called pattern recognition. And as well, I wrote some fundamental papers that introduced the mathematical morphology in a way that could be understood because up to that point, the mathematical morphology was written by the mathematicians in France. Yes. They were doing the, um, they were doing it, they were really smart guys. So they were. And they were, and they were doing it in, in a real, real space. And they had to worry about all of the funny things that can go on in, in a real space. And the application of course was in a digital, digital space. And so I wrote the whole thing from that point of view. And at that point, the academics began to understand what was going on. And then it moved into image processing. And then that whole area of nonlinear image processing, that the mathematical morphology became a piece of it, all having to do with communication. So here you have an instance of two, two instances of communication. One, the first one with the cross validations and so on, um, that was a, a lack of communication between, let's call it the statistics people who knew that very early on to the people who began to do this target recognition. And now here you have the communication 
between the mathematicians in France who nobody could read, not unless you really had a good bad math background. Yeah. You can see the relevance of it. Stan didn't read that stuff. He invented the mathematical morphology by himself. And then eventually he, he, he met John Seurat, who was uh, one of the, the principal authors of the, of the second book that dealt with this mathematical morphology. And they found out they were talking about the same thing. <laughs> so the communication is very, is very important. And a lot of things that are going on are not in the center of their respective fields. They're on the boundaries. And the place where the growth actually is, is often on these interdisciplinary boundaries. Now here we had first an interdisciplinary boundary between let's say statistical people and the engineers who were turning uh, pattern recognition people, target recognition people. The second one, it was a mathematics that was natural for the mathematicians to think about because they don't work in discrete spaces. But the engineers, they were in, in discrete spaces from the beginning. Exactly. It was. Yeah, no, I was, uh, my job was to translate the French stuff and the continuous variable to the discrete guys. This is really fascinating and true. I would say that what's happening now is very interesting because we've been able to get the applied math and the statistics people, you know, and the, and the, and the applications, uh, you know, in the, in the formation of the data science methods, we brought those yes. communities together. Yes. And that's really, they, as, you, as you point out, and I think this is a very important message, and it's far beyond just bioinformatics, it's the fact that data science has come together and has made that communication finally happen. And then the interfaces are now between the data science and the applications of the data science. It's really a shift. Yes, and right now there are a lot of packages that one doesn't have to know the intricacies of the insights. Yeah, now that's another advantage thing. Advantage and you know, disadvantage simultaneously. The yep. advantage, of course, is that you're not programming it yourself. You're using what somebody else programmed. The disadvantage is you may not really understand what is going on, and it may be not the right thing for what you want to do. So, right. my, so that's my, what's so neat about what you presented, Professor, and we're very grateful to that, to, to get, uh, you know, so this, this nice crosswalk between, you know, the CNN and the deep learning methods, which everybody are applying, and getting into the history a little bit and seeing the, uh, seeing the subspace representations and the, and, the, and the Bayesian classifiers and all this other stuff that makes it a more general theory that could be understood from multiple perspectives. Really good. Yeah, for whatever it was worth, it's obvious that my intuition, and I don't say that I'm all knowing by, by long ways, but intuition wise, there's something here to be explored that hasn't fully been explored. There's some use here. And I think it actually, since it's the case that uh, memory has become very cheap, uh, Subspace methods with your tables uh, use memory. You just have to be very careful that your sample size is sufficiently large. And then it seems to, to work well. And, and Jonathan can tell you the, ex the experiments that he did working in the cryptography area and, and solving a problem which is basically NP hard conjugacy problem in, in very complicated groups, which you would never think that, oh, how, how are you going to do that? But uh, he, he worked out a way, both with the, getting the features and running the methods. And in this case, the n-tuple method uh, worked um, better than most of the other uh, methods. There were uh, just a few methods that worked in some instances better. Anyway, he can, if, I'm sure he must have given a talk here about this. But um, well, you know, sometimes they don't talk about those crypto things. So Gavin, we didn't want to steal the show, but this has been a fascinating uh, seminar inside and out. I really appreciate you bringing you guys and Jonathan bringing this together. It's fascinating. 
Okay. Robert, thank you again for the fantastic talk. And, and uh, I always, uh, you know, we, we all owe you all these new fields of, you know, computation and sciences that you created and you're leading. And thank you for your guidance uh, uh, throughout the process. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Yeah,